Good afternoon, and welcome to the fourth session of Becoming a Genealogist and Family Historian. My name is Susan Court. In the first week of, of this webinar, I reviewed some basic concepts, including the motivation and objectives of a budding genealogist, and I reviewed the language used in genealogy, including how to understand cousin relationships and what constitutes a genealogical record. In the second week, I explored the initial and ultimate challenges a genealogist faces, uh, record keeping with paper forms, types of records for in-person and online research, and location of such records for in-person research. Last week, I went online with a discussion of the major websites for researching in general, by topic, by people, and by state, followed by demonstrations of how to use Ancestry.com and FamilySearch.org. Today, I'm going to build on the online options. First, though, I must mention that the views stated here are mine and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Kentucky Genealogical Society. Likewise, neither the Society nor I endorse any service, product, or publication noted or otherwise discussed in the presentation. As I mentioned uh, this afternoon, I want to build on the online uh, research options by discussing the use of software programs for conducting and organizing your genealogical research. As a separate matter, but still online, I will review the use of DNA for genealogical research. I'm going to start with software programs. Um, online service uh, research services such as Ancestry and uh, Family Search are great. I mean, I think we all know that they are great. Uh, but there are things you can, can't do or do as well as you can with a software program synced with one of the uh, online databases. In a nutshell, uh, most genealogy software allows you to build and manage your tree, whether you're online or offline. They let you tailor your workspace to meet your own organizational style and research needs. And most include printing capabilities not available from the online tree building websites like Ancestry or uh, Find My Past. Um, now, here are some of the specific benefits. And as you look over these benefits, you're going to say, well, they look a lot like what I could get from, from Ancestry or Family Search or uh, My Heritage. Well, that is true. Uh, but as I'm going to show you today, there are things that you can do with the software program that really enhances these basic uh, features of a online website. Um, so uh, let me tell you specifically, if you are in the search for software, uh, the features you're going to look for are easy data entry, good source documentation, graphical charts, handy reports, slideshows, scrapbooks, and other publishing options, simple research swapping, compatibility with your computer or your, your operating system, affordability, and capacity to sync with an online family tree. This is an overview of the five top genealogy software companies. It's a few months old. It's the latest information I could find. Uh, there's a, a, a website at the bottom of this page where you can check out if there's anything new on these companies. For those of you who are new to these, uh, this webinar, uh, all of the websites, all of this information really is going to be contained in a manual uh, that will be available um, after the close of the web webinar, which the last week is next Friday, by the way. Um, and so I'm just kind of calling it the October package. So if I'm referring to the October package, that's what I'm talking about. So the five top genealogy software companies are Family Tree Maker 2019, Legacy 9, Family Historian 7, Roots Magic 8, and Family Tree Heritage 9. So this chart, which will be in the October pack package, will you know, indicate what they're known for, you know, generally speaking, what their strengths are, their compatibility, and where to buy them. But I'm going to need to tell you a little bit more about integration because this really is a key feature of any software that you um, may be interested in. So <clears throat> the um, uh, the software programs that I've just mentioned are uh, synced or can sync with the online genealogical research sites. So on the left here are the big four, the big four 
which I talked about last week, the four genealogical websites, which are the most popular um, today, and that includes Ancestry.com, Find My Past, Family Search, and My Heritage. Uh, Ancestry, Family Search, and My Heritage uh, are, as you will recall, are fee-based sites. Family Search is free, but you need to have an account on it. So <clears throat> they sync up with these various genealogic, genealogy software programs. And here's how it works. Ancestry, for example, syncs with Family Tree Maker and Roots Magic 8. Family uh, Find My Past syncs with Family Historian 6 and Legacy 9. Family Search syncs with Family Tree Maker, Family Tree Heritage, Roots Magic, and Family Historian. My Heritage syncs with its own company that's called Family Tree Builder, which is free to My Heritage subscribers and Legacy, Roots Magic, and Family Historian. Now, all of these software programs have great features, so you need to do your homework and shop around before purchasing one that fit, fits your needs, your skills, and your wallet. By the way, this slide probably took me more time to put together than any other slide I've ever produced in, in my career. So, uh, while you subscribe to numerous online databases or research on many free online databases, in general, you just buy one software program. So that's the difference. You subscribe to many of the online databases, but you buy one software program. When you subscribe, you're gonna to have to renew your subscription annually or monthly, depending on what kind of service you purchased um, or subscribed to. Uh, with software, you just buy it. You just It's a one-time purchase, although you may have to spend a little money when the updates come out. But generally speaking, you just buy a software program, but you subscribe to an online database or genealogical websites. So <clears throat> what follows here reflects my purchase and use of Family Tree Maker, which at the time, when I got involved in genealogy uh, 15, 20 years ago, I'd say 15 years ago when I got really serious, it was the main, if not the only game in town. Uh, now, as a subscriber to MyHeritage.com, I also have access to its Family Tree Builder software. So my experience with these two software programs is that they work generally in the same way, although they have different visuals and features. I assume, and I think it's a fair assumption, that the other popular programs work similarly and have the same objectives to facilitate the research, organization, and presentation of the data. So I'm going to cover these topics now uh, for Family Tree Maker, um, data recordation and organization, media recordation and organization, notes recordation and organization, and publication options. My husband says, why don't you just say recording? I said, because I like to say recordation. Anyway, so data, media, notes, publication. Let me start with the data. So if you were to purchase Family Tree Maker, this is the screen that you would, you would uh, when you open up the program, this is what you would see. Um, and so on the left, uh, there is a very handy list of everybody who's in your tree. So if you want to find somebody quickly, you just type in his or her name and um, it, the, the screen will then, or the program will bring up that person. You can also color code um, your research or your data. Uh, I have color coded the four branches of my family. So the quartz are blue, Schlossers are uh, purple. Uh, so you can color code. I only color code my ancestors. Uh, I don't color code collateral relatives. Otherwise, it would be it would just be a mess. Uh, so this is what you're going to see to start with. <clears throat> then <clears throat> you will be given uh, a set of basic fields. This is on the right. So number two here, basic fields name, sex, birth, birthplace, death, death place, just a very short list of fields. You can then customize the view. You can add as many fields as you want. So before you get started, you might wanna step back and think, now what type of information do I wanna cl collect about my family? Residents, occupations, immigration dates, 
military. Uh, so you, you step back and you, you come up with a list of what you would like to uh, include in your data fields. Uh, now, it's really good to do this for another reason besides just, you know, having places to fill in information. It's kind of a way of disciplining yourself as well, because if you have those fields, uh, then you're going to see where you're missing information and it will help you uh, really, actually, it will discipline you and help you organize your research. Now, you don't have to come up with these field names all on your own because Family Tree Maker will provide you with some ready-made fields. And this is the list of Family Tree Maker data fields, address, adoption, arrival, baptism, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, going all the way down to even weight. I don't have that one in, that's not one of the fields that I have included, by the way. Uh, military, I don't know if I could get the weight of all of my collateral relatives. Um, but you can create your own. If you wanted hair color, you could add that as a field. So you want to do that to start off. Now, that doesn't mean you can't add fields as you start researching and then you discover, oh, I really wanted to include email addresses. Uh, you can change it as you go on. But if you're new to the program, I suggest you kind of step back. I didn't do this, so remember, do what I say, not what I did. You're going to have to step back and think about the fields you want to include uh, for your research. Then, um, on again, staying in the right-hand corner here, uh, you have the option of you know, uh, to add a new source citation or use an existing source citation. You're going to find that you're going to build up a whole library almost of source citations, so we'll let you do that. And also place names. Uh, the, the Family Tree Maker has, um, you know, behind the magic curtain, along with the Wizard of Oz, they have... Uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of place names all over the world. So you, when you start typing in um, a place, then you'll get options. So just be sure that if you were doing Covington, it's Covington, Kentucky and not Covington, Louisiana. And there are a lot of cities in Kentucky like that. So you have to be careful uh, when you pick from the drop down list. Okay, so again, I'm going across the, the small a uh, horizontal uh, toolbar here uh, be under the name of the um, person whom I'm uh, researching. And this happens, William Court happens to be my second degree great grandfather. Um, so now I'm on media. And as you can see, all of the media that includes the records, let's say a census record, or I've got two photographs here I took in Manchester, England, when I was doing research there. These are the two places where my, uh, not this William Court, but his son, uh, yes, it is, it is this William Court, uh, had his whitesmith shops and his blacksmith shops. So I took pictures uh, when I was in Manchester of those locations. So you'll see it, it's very handy. You can click on it and the record will come up or the photograph will come up. Then there is notes, and I really, I really, really like uh, the notes section um, because it will allow you to just, uh, as a thought comes or a theme is developed in your research, you can just write it down immediately. And this works like a, a very simple word processing program, like Word or WordPerfect. Uh, you can uh, change the size of the font, you can underline, you can bold. Uh, but what I have found is that as I'm researching, I have thoughts. There will be themes that are developing or there'll be questions. Uh, there are anomalies that I've discovered. I'm thinking, well, I, that can't be right. You know, that can't be the right birth date. That can't be correct. Anyway, so I use this instead of writing it down on a little piece of paper, which I then will lose uh, or sticking a, a sticky note on my computer. Um, this is where I will record those initial thoughts. And then when I'm writing a story, frequently I'll go back to the note pages, print them all out, and it will kind of give me the beginnings of a story. This is my favorite option, publication options. Um, so now I'm, I've moved up to the uh, larger uh, toolbar, horizontal toolbar on the top, and where it says publish. When you hit on this, this is what you're gonna get. These are the options you're gonna get. 
uh, charts and reports, pedigree, descendants, relationship, hourglass, vertical pedigree, horizontal hourglass, bow tie, family tree, extended family, that's one of those big ones, and fan, person reports, individual, custom, notes, task list, timeline, surnames, list of individuals, relationships, family group sheets, kinship, and then of course marriage, parentage, outline descendants, places. Now, <clears throat> Uh, the online companies, the research databases, the genealogical websites like Ancestry and Family Search, um, they have publication options too, and I'm going to cover those next Friday. <clears throat> Generally, though, the software programs offer more publication options, which is one of the main reasons for their popularity among genealogists. So I'm going to show you some of these charts. This is a pedigree chart. I showed you a little mini version of this in the first. Uh, um, session. Um, now this is, uh, it goes back to my third great-grandparents. I actually have six more uh, sets of great-grandparents. Now I don't have you know, uh, nine full sets of great-grandparents. I, I have, I think in the ninth, I have like one. <laughs> so, but this gives you an idea of what a pedigree chart uh, would look like. And if I wanted to print it out like this, which is called a horizontal uh, pedigree chart, I would print it on my computer and I tape the pages together. Or I can print it as a single PDF, can put it on a smart drive and take it uh, to Kinko's or Staples or one of the copying companies uh, and get it printed out. Uh, this is a kinship report. So if you wanted to figure out your relationship uh, with somebody else in your tree or you wanted to compare, uh, get the relationship of one person uh, and another, person in your tree, you can just do this, easy peasy. I have to admit, it's easier than the cousin chart. I feel a little guilty not using the cousin chart, which I showed you on in the first session, uh, but it is a lot easier. Uh, this is a timeline report. So this is a timeline report on Francois Joseph, Joe Schlosser, that's my great grandfather. You'll be hearing about more about him in a minute. And so birth, and then birth of um, his spouse, his first spouse was Barbara. Any, um, and then birth of his brother. So this is a timeline and it is very useful if you're writing a story uh, to help organize your um, uh, material. Outline descendants report. This is for my fourth great grandfather, Moritz Vollmer. He was born in 1689. Uh, it goes all the way down to my dad. It's all the way down. Now, what I love about this report is that it can be custom made. So think of all those fields I showed you before. So let's say you've got the name and, and birthplace and birth date and death and death place and uh, residence, burial, um, occupation, military, immigration. So you can custom make this report to include all of those different fields for all the people. So you can have, it can be pretty large, um, but you can add, you can add any field that you want into this report. I've used this report a lot to fill in holes in my family tree. Um, I would use it uh, to, and have used it uh, to send to the relevant um, branch or cousins in the relevant branch. And I'll say, you know, who am I, you know, who am I missing? Uh, fill in the holes. Uh, you know, who are they? What are their birth dates? Uh, their marriage dates? Who did they marry? Do they have children? So it is a very handy way of of getting, uh, that's kind of a harsh word, of asking for information from your cousins um, because they have something to look at rather than just, you know, just trying to come uh, come up with the information off the top of their heads. So I've used this a lot for that purpose. This is an extended family chart. Uh, this is for my third great grandfather, Francois Jacques Schlosser. As you can see, that, so when it's extended, that means it's his ancestors, his siblings, his descendants, everybody and his grandmother. <laughs> That's an expression that is actually applicable here. Um, there, the page, it, it, uh, uh, if I were to print this out, it would be 2,772 pages. Um, so I'm not gonna do that too often. Uh, this is a descendant chart. There, there's reports and there's charts. This is a chart. And this is what a kind of a typical family tree uh, would look like. And it, it works very, very well as a family tree. And this is for my second great-grandfather, William Court. 
Now, you've seen these handsome dudes before. I had them in my first session. These are two of my nephews. I have nine nephews and nine nieces. Um, and this uh, I prepared for uh, a reunion of the Schlossers. Uh, so I prepared one of those descendants chart using Joe Schlosser, my great grandfather, and then all of his descendants. And by the time we had the reunion, which was August of 2017, um, I had identified 470 descendants, and it's it's way over 500 now. Um, in any event, this chart was 46 feet long, three feet high, um, and my nephews are standing in front of Albert, who is my grandfather, their great grandfather. And one of the really fun things that I have experienced, and actually really joyful things I've experienced as a genealogist is at the reunions and I've had I've put together several reunions but at this one for example I had this chart it went all the way down one wall and about a third of the way down the other and uh, because of its size 46 feet long three feet high and when people came in they were given a yellow magic marker and then asked to go and find themselves on the chart people loved doing that and the first time I experienced that was actually not for this reunion, but for a reunion in 2013 for the Hiles family. And I had a 16-year-old grandnephew who came in. I gave him a yellow magic marker, and he was so excited to find himself on the family tree. What well, makes me kind of tear up here. But it was really a joy, and that's the kind of thing that really keeps you going when you're a genealogist. By the way, I did not print that chart out. Um, on my own on my own printers i put it on a, a um, thumb drive i took it to kinko's and they printed it uh, as one document uh, on a plotter uh, a couple other nice features of um, family tree maker they have a places uh, option or feature it works a lot like google maps uh, and then also if you make a boo-boo uh, they they have a a feature that will help you uh, correct that. Um, sometimes in my enthusiasm for entering data, I have been known, not often, but I've been known to enter this um, information uh, for uh, the same person twice, and so I have to then merge two specific individuals. All right, now I'm going to um, do a little exercise here, researching and um, <clears throat> recording information for Francois Joseph Joe Schlosser, that's my great my great grandfather. He um, was a bear of a man. He was over six feet tall and supposedly weighed about 400 pounds. He arrived from Alsace in 1850 through the port of New Orleans, eventually ended up in uh, Cincinnati for a very short time, and then moved to Covington, Kentucky, where he married my uh, my great grandmother, um, <clears throat> Albertine. Ritz in 1860 at St. Joseph's Church on 12th Street. More information than I really intended to give you, but I just was on a roll there. So I'm going to show you how to research and record information using him, using uh, as the subject matter, and using Family Tree Maker synced with Ancestry. So here we go. So again, you get this, this uh, view uh, of uh, when you open up your program, Family Tree Maker. And on the left there, I put you know, Joe's name in, Joe Schlosser, Francois Joseph, Joe Schlosser, and it pulls up this screen uh, that you see in the middle um, with his father, his wife, his mother. <clears throat> and the first thing you have to do is make sure you're signed into Ancestry. Usually, when I open up my Family Tree Maker program, I'm already, you know, it's it's I'm signed into Ancestry. Uh, sometimes for reasons I cannot explain, I'm not. So I have to make sure that I am signed in. And you do that up there in that little, like just a little thing, you know, the you sort of see the little tree thing leaves, and that's Ancestry. Family Search is the one on the left. So I sign into Ancestry. Um, and once I'm signed in, I'm going to start researching and I'm going to use the shaky leaf, the famous shaky leaf uh, that is Ancestry's icon that. The, their system has has discovered records which they believe the system believes all the little magic people back there with the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain 
which they believe um, uh, are connected uh, to the person whom you're researching. Okay, so that's what the shaky leaf is about. It's just a really one-stop shopping. You just go right to the records, which their system has identified. Now, if you don't see a shaky leaf, don't be worried. Don't be concerned because sometimes it's because of the, the spelling of the name uh, may cause uh, the system not to identify a record. So you just go up to web search and try that. And invariably, uh, rarely have I not been able to find a record unless it's somebody who was born yesterday. All right, so once I hit that, the shaky leaf, I get this list and it goes on much longer, um, but this is what I get. So I look at this and I say, now what, what record am I gonna look for or examine? You know, I'm, I've got a real thing about uh, online trees, so you gotta be aware of tree rot. So I'm, I'm not gonna pay any attention to that first record that is listed there, because they've only got one attached record to it, a couple sources, so eh, not gonna pay attention to that one. Um, now the one at the bottom has four records. I'll probably check that one out just to see what records they may have found. Then I'm gonna hit the 1860 US Federal Census. So I'm gonna click on that. But before I do, um, you'll note that there are three different spellings just on this top of the list here of my great-grandfather's name. Franz Joseph Schlosser, um, Frank J. Schlosser, Joseph Schlosser, um, and so, and, and actually I use Francois because that's what's on his birth certificate uh, because when he was born, Alsace was part of France. Um, but the Franz Joseph is really the German in that's what they spoke. They, both he and my great grandmother who was also from Alsace spoke German. Uh, you'll notice that the name of his birthplace is Modena, but it was really Motern and it's misspelled. But remember census takers, enumerators, uh, they probably didn't speak German. Hard to believe that somebody in Covington, though, in 1860 didn't speak German. But putting that aside, it might have been someone from Italy who was taking the census, and Modena sounded uh, what he thought it was Motern. Uh, once I hit that, this comes up. Look, you're familiar with this, right, from last week. So on the left is the uh, record, what Ancestry calls the record. Um, but it really is an extrapolation of information from the record. And then on the right is an image of the record, the real record, which is the 1860 U.S. Federal Census. Um, so I'm going to save that record. Again, look familiar, right? Uh, I get the screen on the left, which says, you know, who do you want to save this record for to uh, pick your pick whatever preposition you'd like there. Uh, and you have to enter the name as you have it in your tree. This is very case sensitive. So you have to put it in as you have it in your tree. I do that, I hit save, I get the bifurcated screen on the right. Remember from last week, you have to go down, you have to compare uh, what's in the record under review, which is on the left, to the information that is already in your tree on the right. So you just go down the, the two sides and you pick and choose from the new record something that is better than, or maybe brand new, that's not in your tree. And then you can click on that. And then when you get all the way to the bottom, you'll hit save to your tree. Get in the habit, this is just a recommendation, get in the habit of just doing that and save to your tree, hit that at the bottom left and not the top right. Because if you hit it at the top right, you're not gonna really check things out. You, you could form some bad habits. All right, so this is what it looks like. Uh, when I'm uh, finished with that exercise, there's the 1860 record. When I go back to the media file, there it is. Uh, it shows up on the top left is what it looked like before I saved the record. And the bottom right is where I've saved it. And there's the 1860 record. I can click on it and it will give me the, uh, it will have saved and recorded the source citation. So it does, it's, it really does all this work for you. Um, now. Before you close the program, this is really, really important. Um, before you close the program, you need to sync your family tree maker, and I, this is true for all of these programs, you must sync it with your online database. So I need to sync it with 
Ancestry because I want my tree and the records saved on my tree at Ancestry to be the same as what I have in my own database on my own hard drive. Okay, so uh, when you do that, you go up to up there again in the right hand corner and there's this little teeny sliver with little down carrot. If they, if they could have, I don't know if they could have made it any smaller. <laughs> it is so small, but you hit on that and you hit sync and that will sync it up. And by the way, when you close your program, when you close Family Tree Maker, it will back up, immediately back up everything on your hard drive. Uh, it's a great feature. It's, it's an automatic backup. So now I get out of Family Tree Maker and just to go back to Ancestry.com, now I go on the internet, I go to Ancestry, and there's the 1860 record, which has now been, now my Ancestry tree has been synced with my Family Tree Maker data. All right, let us turn to another topic here, and that is genealogical research by using DNA, or just the shorthand is genetic research. So I think most of us know that uh, each person has a genealogical and a genetic family tree. Uh, we probably have heard enough ancestry DNA commercials on TV. So a genealogical relationship is measured in generations, right? And it can include, theoretically, it can include everyone. A genetic relationship is measured in centimorgans. C, little c, capital M. Uh, that is the unit of measurement in genetic research. It only includes some, albeit many, of a person's kin. Um, for example, if I went back 21 generations to my 18th degree great-grandparents, I would have over 1 million ancestors in my genealogical tree. Now, right now, I have about 65 <laughs> entries on my ancestry's genealogical tree, um, and right now, I have about 16,500 cousins in my ancestry genetic genetic tree. So most people have 23 chromosome pairs. We inherit one half from our father, one half from our mother. So does a sibling, but the mix is different. That is why siblings look different, albeit, uh, although identical twins inherit identical combinations. And I think anyone who's seen a CSI or a similar program on television knows about that. Anyway, on average, we inherit 25, and I'm, I'm emphasizing on average, we inherit 25% of our DNA from each of our grandparents. So this is the um, kind of the overview of what I'm going to talk about in the next 20 minutes or so um, for genetic research, where to start, how DNA testing companies compare, how DNA testing works, how DNA companies report their findings, what DNA analysis can do for you. I want you to meet Dr. Blaine Bettinger also, and I'm going to address two frequently asked questions about genetic research. So let me start with uh, where do you start? Uh, you start by submitting a sample of your DNA to a testing company. The leading DNA testing companies are Ancestry DNA, Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage DNA, 23andMe, and Living DNA. GEDmatch is a free online service to compare DNA files from different testing companies. So just a little historical background here. Uh, in 2000, Family Tree DNA was the first company to offer a direct-to-consumer test kit. Five years later, fewer than one million people in the U.S. had submitted samples uh, for genetic testing to Ancestry DNA. By early this year, that number had swelled to over 30 million across all of the U.S. sites. Uh, 23andMe, as you probably know, was the original DNA testing company to report health information. Other companies have introduced this service, although Ancestry DNA dropped its service called Ancestry Health last year. Uh, this is again just a this is just for illustrative purposes, and actually. I forgot to cross out the health options for Ancestry DNA. Um, the, uh, anyway, this is from Family Tree Maker of about a year ago. This is the latest thing I could find that kind of kind of gives you a, a comparison of the price. And the prices are all pretty much the same. And they also have specials. Uh, these companies run specials all the time. Uh, but as I said, with respect to the genealogical websites pricing, 
with respect to the um, uh, software uh, pricing. And now for this, just you've got to check out the current prices and services. So this is just for illustrative purposes. You, basically, you have to do your homework to find out what's best for you. So how does DNA testing work? Um, well, a DNA test looks at hundreds of thousands of markers. My ancestry DNA file uh, is over 13,000 pages long. A uh, DNA report shows how much DNA you share with others who have submitted their DNA to the testing company, you and the testing company, then use those shared Santa-Morgan values to estimate relationships. The more DNA you share with someone, the more closely you're related, and the more recently you have a shared ancestor. In other words, your genetic relationship corresponds to a genealogical relationship. But of course, it's not magic because each generation receives only 50% of the DNA from the previous generation. You will fail to match most of your genealogical cousins beyond the fourth cousin level. And this will come into play when I talk about the tips from Dr. Bettinger. Um, conversely, a second cousin or closer will share DNA. On the right-hand side here uh, is a list of the, you know, generally what uh, certain relationships um, will um, share in, in, um, by way of Santa Morgans. So obviously a parent-child, uh, on average, it's like almost 3,500 shared Santa Morgans. But if you go all the way down to the bottom, to fifth to eighth cousin, you're only going to be sharing like six to 20. So you can imagine if you get down to, you know, the ninth and 10th and 11th and 12th, that basically it just becomes so diluted that you're not going to share um, any Santa Morgans um, of DNA uh, with a cousin. I mean, it could be like a 10th cousin five times removed, uh, but it's just not going to show up. That's why theoretically you can. Um, you know, your genealogical tree can include everybody, but um, your genetic tree cannot. So how do, how do the DNA companies report their findings? Okay, the same genetic relationship uh, can result in several different genealogical relationships. For example, if you share 30 centimorgans with a match, you could have one of several different genealogical relationships. Fourth cousins, third cousins once removed, half second cousins twice removed, or more than two dozen other kinds of relative. Okay. Um, conversely, the same genealogical relationship can't can reflect different genetic connections. So you may share more centimorgans with one first cousin than with another first cousin. So it's not precise at this point. Now, the companies also differ as to how they present the relationship. So I'm going to show you some things. This, by the way, is not a picture of my family. Close, but not. I don't think I have. Oh, I do have some redheads in my family. All right. So this is, and I, by the way, I have submitted my DNA to Ancestry DNA, my Heritage DNA, and also 23andMe. And so I'm going to be able to show you um, examples of things from all three of those companies. So this is how Ancestry DNA presents their my uh, relationships with people who have submitted their DNA to the same company. And so they always list the ones that you have the you know, you have the most you share the most uh, DNA with. Uh, again, measured by centimorgans. So at the very top of the list is Nancy. Um, and we have uh, eight. We share 1,819 centimorgans of DNA. Um, <clears throat> so then there's Brian, and all the way down. And as it turns out, all these people are basically listed as cousins, although the first three are close cousins. Um, but in fact, uh, there's a niece, two nephews, one grandnephew, one grandniece, and one first cousin. And actually, the first cousin is listed here as a second cousin. Uh, <clears throat> this is how 23andMe uh, present their um, matches. So the top three, and I know all these people, the top three are right on. 
obviously the first one, my son, is correct. Uh, it shows that we you know, share 50% DNA shared. Uh, he he uh, submitted his DNA and got his report, and I hadn't seen it yet. I hadn't gotten anything from uh, 23 and me and he called and he says guess what mom you're my mother i said well gee dave thanks i kind of knew that i think i was there anyway what's really kind of neat about this though is that the william listed here is in fact my nephew and ashton ashton excuse me ashton uh is in fact my first cousin twice removed i don't know the the three below i haven't uh had time to actually look into them uh, but I suspect that they're going to, it's probably pretty close. Uh, this is my heritage. Um, they uh, present their finds, uh, the matches, pretty much the same way as Ancestry does. It's pretty much if you're not a son or a daughter or a parent, uh, they're going to, everyone's going to be listed as a cousin. And the, very, at the bottom there is Robert Banks, and he's going to come into, into um, play. Uh, shortly. He's my third cousin, one time removed, descending. So here's something else that genetic research can do for you. Uh, it can help you learn about more about your family's origin, ethnicity, or biogeographical information. I think when people first started to submit their DNA in response to all the commercials, especially from Ancestry DNA, um, is that's what they were really looking for, like where where are my ancestors from? What part of the world are my ancestors uh, from? Uh, you can find new relatives you never knew existed, and you can confirm or correct family trees and pedigrees. Um, so let me go through the three of these. Uh, by the way, the the uh, gentleman in the right hand left right hand bottom corner uh, is Jack Banks, uh, and I'm going to be talking about him. He's related to obviously to Robert Banks. Uh, on the previous page. Uh, now, so learning more about your family's ethnicity. These are the three companies to which I have submitted my DNA. This is how they have, uh, conc they, this is how they've presented uh, my biogeographical bio information. So ancestry, Germanic Europe, 52%, England and Northwestern Europe, 35, Scotland, 11, Wales, 2. My heritage is pretty close, North and West Europe, 49.7, uh, English, Irish, Scottish, and Welsh. Uh, you know, it's sort of very, they're very similar. Now, 23andMe, though, uh, is, is not consistent with my heritage and ancestry. That doesn't mean, well, it's not consistent. I'm just going to leave it with that. So why is there a difference? Why is there a difference between and among these companies? The difference is probably because the companies have different in size data sets underlying their analyses and the status of their analytical approaches. So for example, if a person's ancestry report says they are 56% German, then that means that person has genetic DNA most similar to the population of many of the people living in living 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 in that geographic location now. So now these can change. Let me back up. Your DNA doesn't change, obviously. DNA is DNA is DNA. A rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. But what does change, and why you will get updates or or uh, uh, changes in the way your biogeographical information is presented is that they increase the size of their database or data sets excuse me their data sets um, and they are always improving their technology i mean these companies and it behooves them to do this because this, these are money-making companies are always improving their technology uh, so you will get uh, updates to this type of information Okay, you can find a relative you never knew existed. Um, I uh, mentioned this briefly, I think, in the very first session. So this is a little little mini tree uh, for my great grandfather Charles Cord. He was born in uh, Manchester, England, in 1829. He, had, he and his wife Marianne Murray Court had eight children. 
uh, four born in England, four born in the United States. The first one to be born in the United States was Charles, his son Charles, born in 1861, born in Cincinnati. And then two years later, my grandfather, Dolph Court, over here on the right, 1863. Okay, these are brothers, they were two years apart. Okay. And so Charles Court, uh, born 1861, notice I have so many Charleses and so many Williams in my court family. So Charles Court, born 1861, um, uh, anyway, is my grand uncle. So that's my grand uncle. And because <clears throat> he's my grandfather's brother. The only thing I had about him, my grand uncle, was his birth date and death and the name of his wife, Emma Hightower. Um, I was kind of discouraged from like digging into much, much further than that because he died at a very young age. He was only 23 when he died, shortly after, only about a year or so after he was married. And his widow, as I learned later, um, remarried to a man named Charles Stacy. And then I, I learned that, uh, so leave it there. Now, after meeting his granddaughter, after meeting Charles 1861, Charles Court, I learned that my granduncle, Charles, had one son, and guess what, named Charles, Charles Lewis to be exact. My granduncle also had um, uh, seven grandchildren and at last count, 70 descendants. Now, how did I get all this information? I get, got it from my cousin, Shirley, my second cousin, Shirley, and you know how much I love second cousins, my second cousin, Shirley, uh, I met her uh, through Ancestry DNA. Uh, this is a picture of us having, we were having breakfast at First Watch uh, in uh, Cincinnati. Um, and so I was able to fill in all of this information about uh, Charles Court, born 1861, and his branch of the family. You can also confirm or correct uh, a family tree. And this is the story um, I have for this proposition, um, I discovered through traditional genealogical research, a cousin, a second cousin, one time removed, Lily McLean. She was born in Manchester, England. And um, I, I uh, tracked down her descendants, including someone named Jane Banks. And uh, I, I discovered a tree of, uh, on ancestry uh, that was administered by her husband, Mal Anderson, and it was a great tree. Okay, I know, I'm leery of trees, I talk about tree rot, but now and then you're gonna come across a tree that is darn good and you can tell it's really well researched, a lot of good records. Um, so I was impressed by this tree, so I thought I would reach out and uh, kind of introduce myself to my cousin, Jane. Well, her husband, Mal, said, oh no, you're not related because you, you, we don't match, you don't match on Ancestry DNA. And I said, well, we'll see about that. Well, anyway, Mal suggested that I upload my Ancestry DNA file, that's why I know how long it is, over 13,000 pages long, to my Heritage DNA. And I had it already had a, a uh, because I had access to that because I have a, a full subscription to myheritage.com. And within two weeks, I received a match to Jane's uncle, Robert Binks. And so I told Mal about that, I contacted him. He said, okay, you are related. Uh, Mal and I have eventually became best buds and co-wrote an article about Lily for the Western Ancestor, a publication of the Western Australian Genealogical Society. Um, uh, Robert Binks, who sends me emails almost daily, uh, and Jane, uh, and Mal Anderson live in Perth, Australia. So with the about 12 minutes I've left here, I wanna uh, introduce you to Dr. Blaine Bettinger. Um, I had the privilege and, of, and really it was a great experience of hearing him speak uh, before the pandemic at a um, seminar or conference sponsored by the Kentucky Genealogical Society before the society went, um, uh, totally virtual. And uh, he is a leading expert in the United States on using DNA and genealogical research. He's the author or co-author of several very important books. Um, and these are three tips among many that he gave that day uh, in, in his book 
uh, that I would just want to go through very quickly. So focus first on your closest matches, the ones with whom you have an estimated relationship of fourth cousin or closer. Build a family tree to upload to facilitate finding matches and pursue shared matches. So um, this will be in the October package. So this, these are the, the relatives, uh, the cousins basically, mostly, that you'll want to focus on, uh, where you'll have the most, uh, it's most likely that you're going to get a hit. Um, build a dummy tree. If you don't, if um, like I have a dummy tree or a shadow tree on all three of the DNA sites, even Ancestry, even though my tree, my, um, my officially my tree, family tree is on Ancestry.com, but it is private. So I had to build a dummy tree or a shadow tree um, on Ancestry. And I also have it on my heritage and 23andMe. Then pursue shared matches. So here, for example, um, this is on Ancestry. Um, I, you know, looked at this list of um, of cousins, basically, and uh, I knew all of them except three. I knew the ones that aren't circled. I, I know them. I've communicated with them. I know who they are. I didn't know the three that are circled, so I thought I would just uh, pursue one here, uh, Shane, and this is Shane. He gave me the okay to use his picture, but I decided not to use his last name just for his privacy. And this is these are the matches that Shane and I share. Again, I know all of these people through my research. Not only do I know them through my research, I know them because of family reunions and just talking to them and writing to them. Except for one, all of these cousins listed here are descendants of Joe Schlosser, my great grandfather, as you know. Two are descendants of Joe and his first wife, Barbara and three are descendants of his second wife, Albertine, and I descend from Joe and Albertine. I concluded, I think it's a fairly safe assumption, that my connection to Shane is through Joe and not Albertine or Barbara. Um, then, but what about Tracy? Uh, she is not um, a, uh, she's not a Schlosser. So when I, when I looked into her and, um, the people I share DNA with her, these are all courts. <laughs> so uh, it appears that I'm uh, connected to Shane in two different branches of my got to pursue that a little bit more. Uh, before I leave Dr. Bettinger, I just want to mention that the uh, Kentucky Genealogical Society is forming a members only DNA study group uh, that will study and discuss um, Dr. Bettinger's second edition of Family Tree Guided DNA and genetic genealogy. There's not too many places uh, left. Um, if you were interested or are interested, first of all, you have to be a member. Remember, it's only $20. And you go to KYGS member portal, you select under participate, join a front porch talk group, and the DNA study group is listed there. Now, if it's already filled up, and I didn't check this morning, I have to admit, but if it's filled up, there is an all things DNA, a regular uh, front porch talk group entitled All Things DNA, and you can join that. There's no limit on the number of people who can participate in a front porch talk group. We also have Kentucky Ancestors pre-1850 and Kentucky Scots Irish Ancestors as part of our front porch talk group program. Okay, two questions that are frequently asked about genetic uh, research. Uh, can a DNA company build my genetic tree? Uh, apparently, uh, according to Diane Sauert, a uh, founder and CEO of Your DNA Guide, and this she, this was from an article from Family Tree Magazine from December of last year, each of the major companies is working in that direction, and which in part depends on expanding the databases or the data sets on which they make comparisons. So this is all going to be in your October package um, about what these uh, companies are doing, and I'm just going to kind of show them to you right now. I'm just going to give you an example uh, rather than reading these to you. So this is 23andMe. So this actually is from Ms. Sauert. 23andMe automatically creates a predicted family tree uh, that includes you and anyone in your DNA match list who is a close relative, and they, 23andMe interprets that as third cousin or closer, not just fourth cousin or closer. So they think it's third cousin. 
that's how they define it. It does not always work and it's not always accurate, but the science appears solid. That's not me speaking, that's somebody else. I, I'm not going to opine on whether uh, whether the science is good or bad, but this is what an expert is saying. But I can tell you this, this is what it produced for me. So what's on top, uh, above my picture here, that's my dummy tree. You know, so they that basically comes from my dummy tree that's that I put on 23andMe. But all the little boys and girls down here at the bottom, those are the matches that they that 23andMe has determined are my third cousin or closer from those particular branches. That's the significant thing. I mean, we, I match with all of these people, but what 23andMe has done here is sorted them by branches, and it is darn close. I was pretty impressed by this. Uh, this is an example of Ancestry's uh, DNA matches by parents. So they divide it up between parent one and parent two. Again, it's pretty much right on. Parent one uh, are, is the, the court and the Balmers, and uh, parent two is the Schlossers and the Hiles. So this is also very accurate, or very close. Uh, this one I really was fascinated with. So this is from my heritage DNA. On the right here is a, a message I got from my heritage DNA. And they said, my heritage found a theory that may explain how Melissa, I'm not using her last name, it's Melissa, is related to you. Theory, new theory. Melissa is your third cousin's child on your mother's side. And this is correct because I had found, I'd gotten all the way down to Melissa's father, uh, who is my third cousin. I was doing research. I was writing a story on Valentine Schlosser, who is my uh, great grand uncle. That's Joe's brother. I was writing it for Valentine's family who lives in, um, uh, most of them live in Michigan now. And when I went back to Ancestry.com, I actually found a tree created by Melissa. We are now in communication. My point is this, this is correct. She is my third cousin's child on my mother's side. Uh, Last couple of questions, or last question, who can access my DNA results uh, submitted to a commercial DNA testing company? The process is covered by the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA, which provides generally that only people who have access are customers and others to whom they grant permission. So for example, an employer or health insurance company cannot access a person's DNA report. Law enforcement agencies, except in Maryland, Montana, and DC, District of Columbia, can gain access to familial DNA databases. This access you know, made headlines in 2019 when the Golden State Killer was identified by um, uh, Barbara Ray Ventner, Venter, uh, through a connection to a distant relative. Uh, one of the things, after this, uh, after the Golden Gate um, Killer, Golden State, not Gate, Golden State Killer, uh, story came out, a lot of the DNA companies uh, kind of went back and revisited their privacy policies. So one of the things that you need to do is check your company's privacy uh, policies. And also, if you haven't submitted your DNA to a company yet, you might want to check out their privacy policies if this, in fact, is a concern of yours. I'm going to conclude today was something that Ms. Ray Venter pointed out in her book, I Know Who You Are, quote, all of us are to some degree natural puzzle solvers, curious about what we do not know and excited to unearth secret connections, investigators of our own lines, end quote. So we may not all become genetic genealogy investigators, those are called GGIs, but I do believe that uh, as genealogists, we are natural puzzle solvers. So some final matters very quickly here. The recorded video of this session will be available tomorrow, Saturday, on the Society's channel on YouTube. The first three sessions are already there. And if you do check out the YouTube um, videos or the videos on YouTube, we'd really appreciate if you could you know, comment or like them. Uh, that kind of um, is important for our record keeping, so to speak. Uh, eventually, all five videos will be available on kygs.org, as will a PDF copy of the manual and the other materials 
aka the October package. And at the close of the five week webinar, we will email registrants a PDF copy of the October package. So um, with that, um, all I can say that in the meantime, anyway, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me at susancourt at kygs.org. Thank you very much. I hope you to see you next week. And I also hope that you have just a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.